love the privilege of getting to be pastor here. And it's such an amazing joy to just, you know, to be here, be a part of family, and have the most amazing team that help and put together fears. I mean, you've got Morgan and Tanya and Tasha and Susan and the team that just rise up and uh, make, and Jerry, and make things so amazing. So I just am so grateful. All the Dream Team people, you're just absolutely the best, the best. And there were really tremendous miracles that happened. That's the thing that is so phenomenal about kind of giving some extra time to things of the Lord because God just has, there's so many things that we can just press in and receive from God that when you give that time, it's like you, you allow yourself to receive what God has. You know, being a part of church to me is such a key to success. When you, when you recognize that church um, helps us to strengthen us that there is power in the name of Jesus, but there is this, the army of God. I love the words, you know, that you're saying we're an army rising up. We're people, that this is what God has called us to. So when we gather together, it's gathering courage. It's, it's gathering strength. It's gathering that we can do this together. Because even as we teach on courage in these last several weeks that have just absolutely been a phenomenal series, but, you know, the thing about courage is that the devil does not want us to have what God wants us to have. He doesn't want us to have courage. That, you know, that courage is just that sense of, I'll do this. You know, it's that strength of power that, that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit, that goodness of God, the courage to overcome when we could just back down, the courage to do something that is uncomfortable, that, that sense of having that, that tenacity to say, well, I'll just do it anyway. The courage that says, I have gone through pain, but I'm going to walk through this and I'm going to have what God wants me to have. One of the testimonies of one of the amazing sisters that came up to me yesterday. Yesterday, this is not a, you know Old Testament. This is yesterday. That on her fifth miscarriage, her fifth miscarriage. Every mom in the house that has gone through anything, any husband that has gone through that, you know, the fifth miscarriage. Her husband put her in her car and drove her to Fierce last year. They, he he sat out in the parking lot while she came in, and we prayed for her. Yesterday, as she's talking to me. She's carrying her son that will be born next month. <laughs> courage. That is courage. That is courage. Because, you know, when, when failure comes or when pain comes, when hardship comes, when it's, when it's not fun, when things like when somebody says something to you or when you have an incident that brings pain. And I'm like, you know, they have five. And that husband loved enough and have enough courage to say, we are a team. We're doing something. We're going to let God touch us. And she walks in the door and receives a miracle. And I'm like... You know, that happens in family. That happens as we pray and we believe and we stand with each other. That happens because in, in the face of adversity, and I've been, I, I've, I've been in praise and worship with tears running down my face out of feeling the adversity, feeling the, the challenge, feeling the emptiness, feeling the paralyzation of I can't go forward. You know, the feeling that sense. And instead, you know, you just go, I might feel this way. But I'm not going to let it dominate my tomorrow. I'm not going to let it speak to me about what I will have in my future. Because God wants each and every one of us, not just, you know, uh, the one sitting next to you or not, not me that's standing up here, but every one of us. God has given this spirit of courage, this, that, you know, that, that gutsiness. I meant that, that just, I, I'm going to go for what God wants me to have. And it does take courage. It does take bravery. It does take that sense of, you know, stepping where you, 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 you know, you're going like this when you make the step, you know, you're just shaking. I can't do this, but you do it anyway. So as you, you know, I mean, listening back to the lessons in the last several weeks on the spirit of courage, you know, our, our world needs us as believers to understand what that is and, to, and how we can get it and how in our inadequacies and in our I can'ts, we can have something that God wants us to have. In Exodus 3, that's kind of where I want to start a story on the story of Moses. And I'm going to probably be able maybe to get to Gideon also, which Gideon is in Judges. So if I don't get there, just go read it later. 
But in Exodus 3, we're, we're going to be talking about Moses and we're going to be talking about uh, Gideon in the, the, that who they were as people and how we learn from their real sense of, can I do this? Can I do this? I think that we in church have to really recognize that the Bible is so full of people that didn't think they could. The Bible is so full of their inadequacies. And yet we allow the devil to speak to us today always and only communicate to our inadequacies. Only to communicate to our weaknesses. And we allow our weaknesses to, to control us instead of saying, I might be weak, but I'm going to do something anyway. I might not think I can, but I'm just going to go ahead and walk by faith. I'm shaking as I'm walking. I'm shaking as I'm putting my foot out there. But I'm just going to go ahead and shake a little bit more. But I'm going to put the, my foot down and go forward. Yes, we can. I can't tell you how many times I have shook in my boots over what I'm going to do. I'm like, hello, who wants to stand up here? They say it's, a, it's the most fearful thing to do. And in my inadequacies and in my lack, I'm like, hello, I'm not going to stand up there and talk. I can't do it. You know, praise the Lord, I've been doing it for a few years, and you don't see the same shaking. But man, if you've been doing it 40 years, at least I shouldn't shake as much, you know, as I've. But I did love it when Casey shook a little yesterday with, with our fierce girls. He did such a fabulous job. Come on, girls, did he do a fabulous job? Whew. I mean, and I understood it. I knew that it would kind of, it would kind of press him in, but he did, uh, you did, honey, you did the best. So I just want you to know. So I found this amazing video of Harriet Tedman that I want you to see a particular woman that I have loved her history. And this, the, in this particular video, it doesn't communicate because whoever put it together, they didn't realize because they're not probably saved. They didn't realize Harriet Tedman was a real woman of faith. She was a strong woman of faith. She, every time, even when you read her story, when you see who she, she talks about how she would wait to hear from the voice of the Lord. And she would hear what God would speak to her. So in this video, they don't communicate that as well, but they communicate well a woman of courage. In this very short little video, here it is. Escaping slavery, risking everything to save her family, leading a military raid, championing the cause of women's suffrage. These are just a handful of the accomplishments of one of America's most courageous heroes. Harriet Tubman was born Araminta Ross in Dorchester County, Maryland in the early 1820s. Born into chattel slavery, Araminta, or Minty, was the fifth of nine children. Two of Minty's older sisters were sold to a chain gang. Even as a small child, Minty was hired out to different owners who subjected her to whippings and punishment. Young Minty's life changed forever on an errand to a neighborhood store. There, an overseer threw a two-pound weight at a fugitive enslaved person, missed, and struck Minty instead. Her injury caused her to experience sleeping spells, which we know of today as narcolepsy, for the rest of her life. Minty's owner tried to sell her, but there were no buyers for an enslaved person who fell into sleeping spells. She was instead put to work with her father, Ben Ross, who taught her how to lumber. Lumbering increased Minty's physical strength and put her in touch with free black sailors who shipped the wood to the north. From them, Minty learned about the secret communications that occurred along trade routes, information that would prove invaluable later in her life. In this mixed atmosphere of free and enslaved blacks working side by side, Minty met John Tubman, a free black man she married in 1844. After marriage, she renamed herself Harriet after her mother. Harriet Tubman's owner died in 1849, when his widow planned to sell off her enslaved human beings, Harriet feared she would be sold away from everyone she loved. She had heard of an underground railroad, a secret network of safe houses, boat captains, and wagon drivers willing to harbor fugitive enslaved people on their way north. So Tubman fled with two of her brothers, Ben and Harry. They eventually turned back, fearing they were lost. But in one of her sleeping spells, Harriet dreamed that she could fly like a bird, Looking down below, she saw the path to liberation, and in the autumn of 1849, she set out on her own, following the North Star to Pennsylvania and to freedom. Tubman returned to the South 13 times to free her niece, brothers, parents, and many others. She earned the nickname Black Moses and worked diligently with fellow abolitionists to help enslaved people escape, first to the North 
and later to Canada. Harriet Tubman worked as a Union Army nurse, scout, and spy during the Civil War. In 1863, she became the first woman in United States history to plan and lead a military raid, liberating nearly 700 enslaved persons in South Carolina. After the war, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution legally abolished slavery, while the 14th expanded citizenship and the 15th gave voting rights to formerly enslaved black men. But she was undaunted and she persisted. She raised funds for formerly enslaved persons and helped build schools and a hospital on their behalf. In 1888, Tubman became more active in the fight for women's right to vote. In 1896, she appeared at the founding convention of the National Association of Colored Women in Washington, D.C., and later at a women's suffrage meeting in Rochester, New York. There she told the audience, I was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and I can say what many others cannot. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. As her fame grew, various friends and allies helped her in the fight to collect a veteran's pension for her service in the Union Army. In 1899, she was finally granted $20 a month. In a fitting twist of fate, the United States Treasury announced in 2016 that Tubman's image will appear on a redesigned $20 bill. Harriet Tubman died on March 10, 1913. Even on her deathbed at age 91, she kept the freedom of her people in mind. Her final words were, I go away to prepare a place for you. Amen. That is so good, isn't it? I love that. It's kind of fun to talk about two Moseses this morning. So they just called, called her Black Moses, but all of a sudden we're talking about Moses the Bible, so he's Brown Moses. You do know that he would be brown. So not black, because he would be more of the Israeli kind of look. So you're like, okay, we, we, I'd like to, there you go. I just love this. So when we're talking about these two amazing examples and Gideon that we're also going to be talking about, in that video, I hope that you recognize that we want to talk about courage. And we see this amazing woman of God that had, because she was a tremendous believer. But th there are so many things about that video that I just wanted you to see and to feel of the courage of the, it was impossible for her to do what she was doing. That everything about what she did in her life was absolutely born. There was no, there was no pathway that she had followed to do that. There was no example that she had followed to do that. Nobody had said, come on, girlfriend, you can do that. I mean, go ahead and be, you know, Moses that takes people out of slavery. Go ahead and build a school and get a hospital. Go ahead and lead a regiment of soldiers. What she did broke every single rule of every possibility of anybody being able to do anything. I mean, isn't that true? You have to see that in that. And then on top of that, when you know the story and there's just that so much history of her, when she got hit in the head, she literally was gone for several days. They thought she was dead. They just didn't bury her. They just literally laid her and she woke up. You know, so she should have died through all of this. She, many times she probably should have died. We don't know all of the story because how do you know something that was in such horror of different things that happened in her life, in her world. She could have just crawled up in a little uh, ball and said, you know, I've been abused. I've lost sisters. I've lost brothers. I, I'm, I live in fear that I could be sold any moment of my day. There's so many parts of her story that when you look at there, it just, they're horrifying parts of a story of saying she should have no courage to do something to love and to help humanity. There's really not a, a, a why of that except, except that she was a woman that trusted in God. She was a woman that saw bigger than her inability in her I can't. And I think we have to be people like that. Yeah, go ahead, man. We got to be people like that. You know, she was gutsy, but she was brave. She had a lion, the brave, you know, gut, you know, to be courageous has a lion's heart. And I thought, how, she got something from God that when I look at that, it encourages me to say, Wendy, do that. 
You know, when I see people in, in history and people in the Bible history that have done things that they said, I don't think I can, but they do it anyway. I'm like, okay, I might be shaking. I don't think I can do this. I think this is really fearful. I don't think I have the ability. I don't think I'm educated enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not a man. I mean, all those kind of things have all been things that thoughts and that have processed through my own heart and mind. And I'm like, but what am I going to do? What am I going to do on this time of earth? Am I going to just roll up in a ball and think about all the, the why I cannot to have courage? Am I going to decide that courage is for other people but not for me? Am I not going to rise up and say, man, but the Bible teaches us, the Bible shows us, and then, hum and then our history shows us people that have said, yeah, it wasn't possible, but people were more important. Jesus' will was more important. You know, when we read the story of Moses in Exodus 3, this is an amazing story of brown Moses, just for the fun story part of this. But Moses, okay, so Moses had, the, the, the back story of Moses is a beautiful story where, you know, he was born in a time that any boy that was born in, in, in Israel, they were slaves. Remember, they were slaves at this time in Egypt. So they were all slaves. And if there was a boy born, he was to be killed because they had grown in such numbers. So they were to be killed. So Moses should have been killed. Instead, his mother put him in a safe place, put him into the, uh, the sight of, king, of, the, of the Pharaoh's daughter and, and made sure that he lived and that he did not die. She sacrificed not living as his mother so that he could live. Now he is raised in the king's palace. He is raised with everything that he could ever want. I mean, he was educated, he was dressed, he was fed, he was taken care of in all these different kinds of ways. But then as he got older, he got into some situations recognizing, now I don't know exactly Exactly, because the Bible doesn't give us all definition. But maybe what was happening is here is Moses knowing that he looks at himself and recognizes, and, he, and his sister had been, a, been one of the ones that had taken care of him. So maybe he knew a lot about his own personal history. So maybe, like Tabitha was teaching us, with Tabitha was here as our amazing guest at Fierce, and she's like, you know, she goes, when I was growing up, she goes, I had a white mama and I had a black daddy. So I, 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 I had to deal with where do I fit? How do, how do I relate? Who am I? And, and, and in her world that was very, very abusive, there was nothing good about any part of her story. With abusive added on top of it, with not fitting in anywhere, it's a good thing that glory to God, she got saved and is living for God today. But what about Moses? And what about so many of the stories in this room that we're talking to online in Mill Creek and right here at Federal Way that, you know, maybe Moses, he is he's growing up and he, maybe he's looking at also the people because the, the, there would have been other siblings because, you know, they had lots of kids, you know, whatever back then. And so he was looking and going, well, I don't look like them. I don't look like them. I don't look like them. Boy, I look like her. Where do I fit? How do I belong? He becomes an adult. What do I do? How am I doing this? I'm really powerful. Boom, boom. He tries to start to defend his heritage, but he doesn't know what he's doing. And so instead of figuring out what, who he was, he runs into the, the, the fields. He runs out into the, into the desert. So now he's in the desert. He finds this amazing person Jethro and he marries the daughter so now he's in the he's just out there in nowhere zone just think about it. he's run away he really doesn't know who he is maybe he's really had some challenge with fitting in or figuring out who he is here he's highly educated but he doesn't really fit there he doesn't fit there you know how many conflicts do we have in our stories right here in the room how many conflicts do we have online with you that are listening and, and Mill Creek that are watching you uh, that are right there too that you know, the conflicts of all of our stories that many times unfortunately in the conflicts of our of our background and the situations that have happened around us instead of like figuring out or rising up like uh, uh, Harriet Tudman did we rise up and we said well I don't know run instead so we see that Moses ran but when God 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 says wait a minute I know you've been running. I know you don't think you're worth it. I know you don't value what I have put within you. I know maybe you don't even value that you've been saved because Moses was saved from death. You and I in this room that have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we've been saved from death. Come on, somebody. We've been saved. Amen. So we're saved. So Moses, here he is. He's, you know, he's just minding his own business. Some of you right here, you're like, I'm just minding my own business. Moses was tending the flock. He said, I'm just working. I'm just living my life. 
okay? And the burning bush shows up. Now, many of us have heard at least of the burning bush that spoke to Moses in the wilderness. And the, in the burning bush, Mo, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to Moses. And, he, and, and the Lord said, I have surely seen, in verse 7 of Exodus 3, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I know their sorrows. When I read this story and I read, then I look in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, I've called you to go and make disciples. Go out and make disciples. He calls us as his children to go out and do good and help people. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Moses was called, he says, I, but Jesus, excuse me, God was speaking to Moses and saying, I see the oppression on my people. I see the pain of humanity. I see what's going on. And I thought, you know, in, in, of understanding of this message for us today, God sees the pain in Federal Way. He sees the pain in Mill Creek. He sees the pain of you that are online in the place that you are living. He sees the pain in Kent and in, and in uh, Fife and in Tacoma. He sees the pain in Everett and Linwood and around the areas. He sees the pain of your mom and your dads and your sisters and your neighbors. He sees the pains of those that you work with. He sees the sorrows of the world that we are living around. And I went, he knows what is going on, right? He also knows what, he's gonna, what Moses is going to say right here. Moses says in verse 11, but Moses says, God, who am I? Who am I? Really, God? I mean, who am I? What, 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 what should I do? I mean, what, how, how can I help people? What can I do? Then in verse 13, he continues on. Moses continues on. Then Moses says, God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, they'll say, or maybe we would say, God, when I come to the people in my neighborhood or the people in my family or the people that I work with or the people who are in my school, when I come to those people, they'll say, who, wait, excuse me, the God of your fathers has sent you? And they say, what, who, what are you talking about? Who is that? You know, and so we immediately, I don't know about y'all, but I can see myself and the insecurities of who am I? Like, how important am I? Then it continues on in Exodus 4 and verse 1. Then Moses answered again, he's talking to God. But suppose they will not believe me or they won't listen to me. Suppose they say, oh, come on, who is God to you? See, to Moses is, now this is kajillion years ago, right? This is a long time ago. But I feel like these are the words that I'm saying to God also. This is us in understanding what is courage. What is courage for every one of us that is listening right now? What is courage for us in making a difference in the world that God has called us to? You know, what is it, what is it that we're to do? And I like when I look at, when I'm listening to this and I'm going, oh my gosh, these are the words that I would say. Then we look in verse 30 of also Exodus 4. Then Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. How many of us in the room, how many of us at Mill Creek, how many of us feel, oh man, I, I can't remember scripture. I don't remember what to say. Don't you know, I'm not very good at this. See, this is exactly what Moses, our amazing hero of the Old Testament, is speaking to God. Before we saw the movie with Charlton Heston, Let My People Go. <laughs> I mean, before, we, you have to recognize that we might have this picture, picture of like Moses, but this is Moses speaking to God first. This is you and I when we think about our life. This is me when I think about what God has called me to be. This is me when I'm saying, are you kidding me, God? Are you kidding me? I can't talk. I can't put a line in, in sentences. I didn't even say that way. I, I, I'm like, excuse me. I mean, you know, I've had more people say, uh, I kind of understood you. I got lost a little bit, but I came back. And I went, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm so sorry. I try my best, you know. But I, and, and, and I, I know that. And then, it's, and then it says, but he said, oh, Lord, please send um, by the hand of whoever else you will send. That's in verse 13. See, then Moses not only says, uh, wait a minute, don't send me. He also said, well, I can't even talk. And then he says, oh, no, not even send me, but send somebody else. How many of us in the room say, somebody else would do such a better job? 
Somebody, uh, somebody else talked to my, my mother or my, my mother. Somebody else talked to the person that I work with. Somebody else testify to my neighbors. Somebody else be a witness around in my life. And world. Somebody else rise up and courage. Somebody else start a business. Somebody else be courageous. Somebody else, you know, drive your wife to the, to the, to the meeting and wait as she prays in faith to receive a miracle. Because why, why should we, after five miscarriages, have courage to do to have courage for one more time? See, it takes courage to do when you're hurt, when you're in pain, when you feel inadequate, and you feel you can't do it. It takes courage, church. You know, and, and, and the thing about the devil loves to do is to convince us of our inadequacies, to convince us of you can't do that. You know, I, I wonder how many times the hero of Harriet, how many times did she hide in fear when she was saving people, and she knew that if they were caught, they would be killed. I mean, she wasn't even having to have conversations in that sense. She knew that if they were caught, what would happen to her? And how many times when she pulled an army of people together, I'm like, she, she, she led an army of, of people against slavery. Now, not only did she build a hospital, how many times went through her mind, oh, I'm so smart, I think I'll build that hospital. I think I'll just build a school on top of it because I'm so smart. I mean, come on, somebody. I got it all together. Do you think that's what she was thinking? I mean, there is no possibility that she was thinking those thoughts. She was going, ah, 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 I'll take another step. Now, there is very strong testimony of words that were spoken about her that she would, she would stop and she would wait and she would let the Holy Spirit direct her step. And I'm, I'm like, I will follow that example. When I, I need courage, I need to be gutsy. I need to go forth. And when I feel like this, I'm going to say, Holy Spirit. Holy, that must be Holy Spirit all over me then. That's not fear shaken. That's not fear shaken. <laughs> That's Holy Spirit. Or I'm saying... I'm saying that you and I are regular people. We're just regular people. We get up, we, we, we hopefully pray a little bit, read our Bible a little bit. We hopefully have a little bit of breakfast or maybe not skip it because maybe those want to faster or start eating at 12, eat to 5, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You might be one of them. Whatever you do, you know, whatever your daily habit is, exercise, go to work, you know, corral the kids out. You know, you're like, no, Wendy, I just live my life. And then I come home and, you know, hope that there's something good on HGTV that night. And that's about it. You know, I'm praise the Lord, you know. I mean, hey, come on. And I'm like, I get it. But we are called for such a time as this. That our Egypt needs us. You know, our Egypt, your Egypt. You know what I mean when I say Egypt? Moses was, needed, he was called back to Egypt. We are called to the place that God has put us in. The sphere of influence that God has put us in. Wherever we are living is our sphere of influence. The people that we know is our sphere of influence. The people that we have conversations with is, is in our sphere of influence. That's the Egypt that God has called us to. That's the place that God says to Moses. And Moses says, eh, but don't you know I don't talk very good. Okay, so that's all right. Talk to God about that. So you can speak to God about those things. I don't really know that I can do that. Very good, God. I mean, really? Seriously? I have to do something that I'm really not very good at? And God says, excuse me, who's rating your good? Who convinced you that you're not good at that? What voice are you listening to that you cannot do that? You know, I wonder how many times Harriet thought in her mind I, that she said, I really don't know. Can I really start a school? I've never gone to a school. Should I really start a hospital? I've never even, I'm not, I've never even gone to school to be, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but wait, maybe I'll start something and do something that is way beyond my ability, but I hear the voice of the Lord. When, when um, in, in my life, you know, in prayer, I'll say, there's been several times, and this is a dangerous thing to do when you're praying. When you're praying, you say, hey God, am I missing something? You know, is there something you'd, you'd like to kind of talk to me about, you know? And the, one of the times I remember very clearly, I'd been praying, and, and uh, the time just went to zero. I'm pretty sure I have more, right? It says zero up there, but praise the Lord. Okay, that means you're done. You're done. The light that just went, you're done. 
<laughs> okay, but I'm not. And, and so, <laughs> so, so when, when, I was, uh, when I was praying, the Spirit of the Lord said, um, I said, God, God, is there anything I'm missing? And God said very clearly, he said, children. And I went, we'd been here seven years. So it isn't like we'd had lots of conversations and real desire. But in our environment, like children were not positive because you were never good enough to have kids. It was really a silly thought. But any which way, some people that we were around and followed in mentorship, it was like, no, 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 you still have a lot of more renewing to do. You're not strong enough yet. Don't have kids, right? So, but as I was praying, the Spirit, I said, what am I missing? And the Spirit of the Lord says, kids, as loud as you can hear, kids. And then I said, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid. Is there something, like, there are certain things in life that you really want, but you're so afraid to do it. You're so afraid to take that step. And I said, oh my gosh, God, I'll just, I'll wreck it. I'll be a horrible mom. I'll be horrible. And what can I do? And, and the Spirit of the Lord right there, I mean, the word came to me. He said, you walk by faith. Raise your children by faith. So I interpreted that when I was 20-some years old. My interpretation was, oh man, if I, if I you know, build, live them by faith, then we'll have no problems. That's it, man. Woohoo! I got it. And then as, as life went on, I realized God said, oh honey, that's not what I said. I, I said, walk by faith. There'll be all kinds of situations, honey, that you'll have to walk by faith in order to do that. But when you walk by faith, you can win. When you walk by faith, you can have and do what God has called you to do. See, so I'm just glad that God didn't show me the other part of that story. Or I might have went, I'm too afraid. Because there are things that I believe that God is speaking to each and every one of us in this room and at Mill Creek and online that say, there are things that he is saying, listen to me. It's time to do some things that will take some courage. It'll be, there's things that I want you to do. The Egypt that you're supposed to reach, you need to step out in some places of courage. When I, so the second thing was uh, one time I was praying, and I can really tell you, I could tell you even where I was, and God said, time to write a book. And I was like, uh, uh, I, think, I, th I, think, I think you meant that for, mm, I think you meant that for that person over there, God. Because I don't have any dream of writing a book. I think that's somebody over there. You, I, I, excuse me, let me move out of the way. I think that's for somebody else over there. I don't think that one is for me. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord. I feel like, you know, like how Moses said, Can, no, have somebody else do that. Have somebody else be that. Have somebody else step up to that place. And God says, no, no, I want you to write a book. And I said, no, God, don't you remember my story? And, you know, when, when you ask God, don't you remember something? Excuse me. He was right there when it happened. You know what I mean? So the story is that really was kind of this, you know, sealed deal that happened to me was I was a, what, about a senior, maybe a junior senior in high, in high school, and I'd gotten a B on a, some English paper that I wrote. I went into my counselor. I was all mad. I said, I got a B on this paper. She got an A. And he read it. And he said, you know, Wendy? nicely nice guy really nice guy that's why I went in to talk to him you know I went in there and he says you know it's a b he said just just accept the fact you're never going to write a book when he said that boom sealed the deal locked the door you know and and he and, and in a lot of ways, I'm going to just say to you in the natural, I'm not a great writer. There's nothing about me that's a good writer. I mean, I'm like, I understood why he even said it. So when God said, write the book, I'm like, excuse me, I think, it, I think you're supposed to talk to somebody else. Because I can't do that. And God says, you have a message I want you to write. I want you to do this because I want to reach Egypt I'm going to reach somebody that, you, that, that will reach that you, can't, you need to do this. And I'm like, oh, right. So I wrote the book, and I, God gave me amazing people around me to help me, right? I, I had this one, um, Terry was my assistant for 32 years. So, I mean, she was like a sister. And we, she helped me write the book, and she was, she's very good at putting all that stuff together. So, so, the, so the book is all done, right? I stand up to the church back in the old building. I stand up, and I hold my first book, and I said, uh, but, uh, here's, here's my first book. I said that, that me and Terry wrote. 
like, I don't know, I'm so sorry. If you want it, go get it. But I'm like really sorry. But me and Terry wrote this book. And then I go back, right? I was so, I, I mean, like, I, I had no confidence. I, I was not like I was like, hey, wrote me a book. You know, oh, I'm just so good. You know, praise the Lord, you know. And so Terry, my a wonderful assistant, she, the next day, which was so uncomfortable, she goes, oh, Winnie, I need to talk to you about something. Very serious, you know. And she, and I, I, we walked, I walk in her office. I sit down and she goes, Winnie, I need to tell you something. And she goes, Wendy, I didn't write that book. And I said, what? what? And she goes, you said yesterday you and I wrote that book. She goes, I didn't write that book. You wrote that book. It was your mission, your calling, and your word. I helped you do what God told you to do. But next time you stand up, you need to stand up and say, "Uh, here's my book. (laughs) <laughs> you know, but she says, that's what you've been called to do. See, even, even at the finish line, I still was like, I was like Moses going, I'm not eloquent. I can't do this. But still it has sold. I don't know. I have sold thousands of books. I don't know why, except the fact that God said, write them and people will use them. And I am just grateful. I am just like, it's beyond. I could ask or think, you know what? The thing is, is that you're also to do things that sometimes you're like, like, really? Really? I'm supposed to have courage? I'm supposed to be gutsy? I'm supposed to be lion-hearted in ways that I cannot see? I don't know that I can do it. Moses says, no, no, somebody else can talk better. He even made his brother speak before Pharaoh. He said, no, brother, you speak. Let, it, let, let them hear your voice. And still God did not take the calling off of him. You know, so, there's so many of us in this room that I just want us to be encouraged I want us to feel um, um, uh, motivated. I want us to feel that, that we are strengthened as, because we're all inadequate. None of us are all together. None of us have it. None of us can remember scriptures always, except a few of you, like Terry Tarsig. But other than that, I tease Terry all the time, you know, in Bible school on, man, because we've known each other forever. And I'm like, he just remembers things. And I'm like, good for you. Praise the Lord. But I don't, you know. But, but I, I guess I want to say, as a, just as a, to all of us, you know, all of us have gotten hit in the head over certain things of life. All of us have had challenges that could stop us from doing what God has called us to do. All of us have had Moses experiences that, you know, you kind of go, uh, I, I don't know what to do. I'll just go over here and just lounge over here. And then God says, excuse me, excuse me. It's time to rise up. And he's speaking right now out of the burning bush of, we need you to get in the game. We need you to start doing something. We need you to start recognizing that your Egypt is your sphere of influence. Your Egypt is a people that you have in conversation around you. And it says, what is, what is the lion-hearted thing that the Spirit of God is speaking to you to do? You know, Heather told a testimony on one of the, in fact, I think it was shown last week where Heather felt when she was praying, God says, Seattle, Seattle. And she's like, what? You know, so she comes to Fierce a year year ago and she comes to fierce and walks in and she walks into the foyer i actually remember meeting her and she said to me i'm moving god's called me here and i remember thinking well we'll see if that's for true because i've heard a lot of different stories and she moved what courage to move to come to a place that she did not know what courage for bridget as we heard the story as she's driving by and she's in an abusive relationship she sees the crosses comes to church all alone with her son and trying to figure out what her next steps were. And I'm like, it takes courage to to do things. It takes courage when you feel like you're shaking and you're all alone. But I guess I want to say, we are the lions of the Northwest. We are the called to make a difference. We individually, in the sphere of influence that all of us have, need to say, what can I do in, in my life? How can I rise up? I get it. Moses was afraid. Moses was afraid. I'm afraid sometimes. But let's do it anyway. Let's do it anyway. Let's just do it anyway. When you're afraid, when you're shaken, you say, good thing faith is a part of this. Good thing that I'm a part of the whole team of Christian faith, that we're all shaken, but we're all being courageous. And we're just going to be lying hearts and make a difference in our world. We're just going to go head on and do it. Come on, let's do it, team. 
let's make a difference. How many of you say, and I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna shame you into raising your hand right now. So just do it right at the beginning. How many of you say, okay, I, I'm gonna go head on and I'm gonna be the Moses of my world right now. I'm a little bit shaken. I'm a little bit afraid, but I'm gonna go ahead and be courageous. I'm gonna do something with courage. I'm gonna step up. I'm shaking in my boots, even lifting up my hands right now. But I'm gonna lift up my hands and say, come on, Mill Creek, you better be lifting up your hand. Casey, check them all out. Make sure they're lifting their hand. Come on, Federal Way, are you lifting up your hand? Come on, lift your hand. Say, I'm doing it. Come on, loud. I'm going to do it. I'm going to roar with God's courage because he's going to give me courage even when I'm shaken. Come on, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.